person. And then we'll get started. So again, welcome. I'm excited to announce this webinar, which is launching and kicking off Fair Wild Week. And the topic of Fair Wild Week is wild plants are our business. And that's also the topic of this webinar. And I'll briefly introduce every, everyone and then hand it over to Caitlin, who will talk some about the traffic's work. The speakers today, there are a lot of speakers. Um, and I'll say a little bit, and then they can say a little bit more about themselves. Caitlin Schindler, Project Officer for the Wild at Home Project at Traffic. Julia Muir, Nonwood Forest Product Specialist at FAO. Susan Curtis, Director and Brand Ambassador at Neal's Yard Remedies. Marin Anastasov, Head of Procurement at Pucka Herbs. Aaron Smith, Director of Herbal Science and Research at Ban Bot Banyan Botanicals and also board member and co-chair of the Sustainability Committee for APA, and Andrea Rommeler, Sustainable Wild Collection Manager at Martin Bauer. And thank you all for joining again. And I wanna also thank the sponsors of the Sustainable Herbs Program and our underwriters and American Botanical Council members, which allow our participation in this, in co-hosting this webinar. So with that, I'll hand it over to Caitlin. Thank you, and just share the screen. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne. So yes, as Anne said, I am Caitlin, and I work at Traffic. We're one of the co-hosts of the webinar today. Just in case you aren't familiar with Traffic. Uh, we are a leading non-governmental organization working globally on the trade in wild animals and plants uh, in the context of both biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. So Traffic has a focus on plants, uh, work project in plants, and we very much include wild plants in our definition of wildlife. So before we get started on the themes of this week and this webinar, I thought we'd just set the scene a bit on wild plants, talk about some facts and figures, and also what are the challenges around them. So wild plants are everywhere, but they generally tend to go unnoticed. So they're in all sorts of products from medicines to teas, soft drinks, cosmetics, hair products, perfumes, uh, furniture, and spices. Uh, they tend to go unnoticed uh, largely because they're either not proclaimed as a wild ingredient or they can be hidden down ingredient lists, uh, sometimes under kind of funky names in the ingredient lists as well. So it's not so easy to find them. To put some numbers around it, there are 26,000 plant species that currently have a well-documented use. Only about 10% of these uh, have, have, have had their conservation status assessed. And of those, only 11% or one in 10 are threatened with extinction. And a whopping 60 to 90% of those are thought to be wild collected, so not farmed. So they're actually quite a major issue. Uh, and the international trade of medicinal and aromatic plants has increased threefold in value over the past two decades. And there's an accelerated increase, especially in medicinal plants expected due to COVID-19. So if we think about some of the ecological threats that are facing wild harvested plants, uh, they can include habitat loss or land use change, over harvesting uh, or improper harvesting techniques, especially with the loss of traditional knowledge and climate change as well, the big one. Uh, some of the social risks around wild plants generally uh, can include tough physical labor and often with inadequate health and safety provisions. Uh, low pay, uh, child labor, sometimes where the whole families are involved in the harvest, children can be involved as well. And sometimes in the very worst cases, you can have slavery or debt bondage. So actually, wild plants need to be a focus of uh, companies' due diligence. 
So what are the opportunities around wild plants now that we've looked at the challenges and also why is now the time to act, uh, especially at the beginning of this fair wild week? So there's an increasing consumer demand for sustainable products. Um, and especially with COVID, people have had more time to reflect on their values and how they can reflect those in their purchasing habits. Businesses have a responsibility to ensure the ingredients that they're sourcing uh, don't have an adverse effect on the environment and are socially responsible, um, especially in the light of some, uh, sorry, there's a poll up right now. It'd be great if you could uh, respond. Uh, just let us know where you've come from today. You can also drop some comments into the chat. We forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, you can let us know where you're from or any comments you have around the poll. So yes, so also considering some of the uh, policy and legislative frameworks that are evolving, it's the perfect time to act and actually quite a critical time to act for wild plants. Um, so we consider it a super year for biodiversity policy. So for example, with the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 agenda, and there's also some potential uh, incoming new EU due diligence requirements. So stronger commitments by governments and also increasing demands on business can be expected. So now is very much the time to act on wild plants. So I mentioned that there are 26,000 wild plant species in use. With so many wild harvest ingredients, uh, where can you start with them? So one thing that traffic has done is to narrow down the focus and make that first step a bit easier by focusing on the wild dozen species. So these are 12 species picked, not necessarily because they are the most traded, however, they do tend to be popular in trade, um, but they can also act as flagships of the opportunities and challenges of wild sourcing. So you can see from the list there, they kind of spread across the geographic uh, spectrum. The ingredients are also found in different industries and they also have um, different kind of endangered statuses. So some of them are endangered or red listed, um, some not. Some are CITES controlled and some are not. So you've kind of got a good spread there of a, a whole range of different wild harvested plant species. And the next speaker, uh, Julie from the FAO is gonna to touch on some work that Traffic and the FAO are doing together to make that first step in responsible sourcing of these wild dozen ingredients easier and to create some tools around that. One thing to consider also is that best practice standards are available in wild plant harvesting and sourcing. Uh, so Fair Wild is one that Traffic works very closely with. It's our partner, in fact, we have a partnership agreement with Fair Wild. Uh, so Fair Wild is a sustainability standard with third party audited certification. It can be applied globally and it can be used on harvested or wild harvested plants, fungi and lichen. It's unique in that it focuses on wild collection and also that it combines both fair trade, so social and ecological sustainability. There's a ton of information on Fair Wild on their website. Um, my colleague, Emily, who's also the uh, business coordinator for Fair Wild is in the webinar today. She'll drop her contact details in the chat in case you'd like to reach out. So finally, to bring that all back in, why we're here for Fair Wild Week and for this webinar. Uh, so the Fair Wild Week, what is it? It's an annual online campaign. We've been running it at Traffic and with Fair Wild since 2017. The aim of the week is to raise awareness about the importance of sustainable and equitable trade in wild plants, and also to promote buying from businesses that are committed to sustainable wild plants trade. The theme this, week, this year is Wild Plants Are Our Business, also the theme of the webinar. Uh, so our speakers today are gonna to be talking around that theme and also why wild plants should be everyone's business and why now is the time to act. Uh, they're gonna be offering some practical advice on how to get started with responsible sourcing of wild plants. Uh, and I'll come back to the themes of the week and the hashtags as well at the end of the session. Um, but for now, that's all from me. I'm gonna close the poll as well. So I'll just share the results there so people can see. Thank you, Caitlin. And Julia, do you wanna say a few words about the work of FAO? Mm -hmm. 
Can you see my screen? Yes, it's not in presenter mode yet. Okay, bear with me. No, oh, no, I always do this, pardon me. Okay. There we go. Well, good enough. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little overview of why FAO or why wild, wild plants are FAO's business. I'm uh, Julia Muir. I've been working at the FAO for about 14 years now. Um, Sven Walter is our team leader and we also have Simona Sorrenti. So we're a small team. It's a big organization, but this is um, one of the uh, teams dedicated exclusively to wild plants or non-wood forest products, non-timber forest products if you're in the States probably. Okay, I'm gonna have to go out of screen sharing here. I'm frozen, sorry about that. Do you wanna just wait while it unfreezes, go ahead and talk a bit about the projects, the program. You're muted. Okay, FAO is our main area of work is um, focused on the four betters. So better nutrition, better environment, um, better lives and better uh, productivity, agricultural productivity. Um, we have a program where um, we have, uh, our work is focused on, um, or at least the wild plants program, our work is focused on three main pillars. So the first main pillar is data and evidence. We work a lot on data in the sustainable and nutritious value chains. And the third, there you go, Let's do it this way. And um, I was down here. And the third is creating that enabling environment. Um, why wild plants are our business? Well, for a lot of reasons, um, there's certainly a lot of are very nutritious. They contribute to dietary quality, dietary diversity. They're climate resilient. Um, you've probably heard it's the decade of ecosystem restoration. So a lot of these plants are embedded in a lot of our restoration and land rehabilitation programs. You might've heard, uh, for example, of Action Against Desertification. It's a separate program, um, extra budgetary. So funded by the European Commission, but also contributing to this area of work. Um, of course, uh, a part of FAO's mandate is also improving uh, or reducing rural poverty and wild plants really um, contribute to, to income generation, to better livelihoods. There's a basis of healthcare for millions and that last point undervalued part of multiple billion dollar indices. I'm sure you've heard of the term hidden harvest. So a lot of these plants really are hidden um, from statistics, hidden um, hence to decision makers, industry and consumers. Um, this is an example of our work in Uganda. So contributing to um, capture some of these underassessed foods. Um, they currently are hidden from, again, dietary surveys and dietary statistics. Here we have some capacity building uh, that we do on the left. We have um, balanides kernels, which we uh, then transform into that balanides oil you see on the right. Um, so really with a big focus on um, adhering to quality standards. Um, and food safety standards. And then which brings us to our work with, with traffic, assessing risks and opportunities of the wild plants trade. Um, thank you, Caitlin, for these wonderful graphics. Um, um, so essentially, the, as Caitlin mentioned before, the wild dozen, these plant flagships. Now, if you think of conservation, everyone can think of, for example, animals, the panda, the gorilla, but we don't really have that um, with plants. And our aim is really to create these, um, this wild dozen, um, and to draw consumer and industry attention to these different species. Um, hopefully with more funding, we can go beyond the 12, but we're starting with 12. This is just an example. Again, thanks to Caitlin for the graphic. Um, we're working to create this traffic light system with different products. This is Vitellaria, so she butter. Um, and so on the, you have uh, social, um, uh, identifying social risks as well as, as conservation risks all in a format which consumers and industry can, um, 
can understand and read. So um, sorry for, for the technological difficulties. Get in touch if you wanna hear more about our work. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna to turn to the, um, to the different speakers. They'll each have a chance to speak a little bit about why, why wild plants are key to their business. And Susan, I wanted to invite you to go first. Okay, thank you very much, Anne. Um, so- Just one sec, oh yeah, okay, to stop. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So we use fair wild ingredients in a lot of our products in, at Neil's Yard Remedies. We sell medicinal herbs, we sell aromatherapy, essential oils, and we make natural beauty products. And wild ingredients occur in each of those categories. I've been with Neil's Yard Remedies since nearly the beginning in the early 80s. And um, we've been aware of some of the issues around the pressure on resources um, since that time, at first through the IUCN and then once Fairwild um, got traction and got going, uh, thanks very much with the Fairwild Foundation. So about 25, 30 years ago, I was made aware of problems around the overharvesting of gold and seal, which we would sell as a tincture and a, and a dried herb. And we worked with our suppliers at that time to make sure that all the golden seal that we sold was cultivated and not harvested from the wild, which at that time seemed to be the best option. I'm not sure that would be the best option now. I think um, fair wild certified, um, but wild harvested would be a good addition to that. But at the time that, that, that was definitely uh, the best option. Since then, um, we've added fair wild baobab oil to our range, certified fair wild rosehip seed oil from Serbia, um, and a range of fair wild uh, teas in tea bags, um, all certified. But um, argan oil, I'm just going to talk quickly about two um, products that are on the, the top dozen um, that you've mentioned already um, for Fair Wild Week and Argan Oil. I've been visiting um, Morocco since the early 1980s, at which time Argan Oil was really not very well known. It wasn't really being sold in the West. And it was really in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, that it suddenly took off. And now, of course, the pressure on um, supply has become enormous because it's such a popular ingredient. Um, but I think actually the other really important reason to get certified um, argan oil is that uh, it's really hard work to get argan from the nuts. And there is a real problem with the exploitation of women. So as well as the sort of wild aspect, the fair trade aspect, I'd really encourage everybody to only buy fair trade certified um, argan oil because that is such a big issue. Um, and then the other key ingredient that I want to mention is frankincense. All of our um, frankincense essential oil currently is Boswellia sacra from Oman. And we source it from Oman because um, the Omani government do do more than just about any other government to try and ensure that it is sustainable. And all frankincense currently is, is harvested from the wild. Um, but even in Oman, there are lots of pressures on the trees. There's um, overgrazing by camels, there's the impact of cities growing, those are probably the main things. So our um, frankincense essential oil is um, organically certified, which means that the trees are inspected every year and we're given a quota of the amount that we can take, so we currently do what we can in that area. It hasn't yet prove possible to get it fair wild certified in Oman, but um, hopefully that's something for the future. So I'll, I'll hand back there. <laughs> Great, thank you. And we'll come back around to dig in a little bit more. Um, next, Marin, could you speak a little bit about why herbs, why wild plants are key to your work? Yes, sure. So just to confirm, um, uh, this is only about the introduction, and then I'll speak about the species that we selected later, yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining the, this uh, webinar. So uh, my name is Marin, and uh, I'm Head of Procurement for PACA, who is uh, an international herbal brand. And uh, our 
products, uh, organic herbal teas and also organic food supplements. And we source uh, from over 30 countries and we also sell uh, into more than 30 countries. So we are truly international business when it comes to both sourcing and sales. And uh, within that, we uh, use uh, around, or this year we'll use about 2000 tons of uh, herbal components. Um, and we've got about 180 species in our portfolio. And out of these, about 20% come from the wild. So uh, about 20% of our uh, components that we use in our products come from the wild. And by volume, 95% of these are fair wild certified. Um, so the majority of what we have in terms of wild collected species in our portfolio uh, would be fair wild certified. And we have some uh, certain species which we use a lot of, uh, things like um, licorice, for example, I'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, which is one of the um, 12 species on the wild dozen list. But we also use other components like lime flowers and elderflowers and rose hips um, and apples and uh, dandelion, etc. And the primarily why we use wild collected plants is primarily we use them because of their therapeutic uh, properties and, and the benefits that they bring into our products. Uh, because we, we really, all our products uh, into the health, health, um, healthcare or a kind of a personal well being uh, space. And in that respect, we are looking for things like essential oils, active plant compounds, phytochemicals, etc., that may be present in those species. Um, and by using them, we then deliver this to our consumers and our customers. Um, wild collection uh, or collecting wild species is, is very important operation for uh, communities and people who are landless or poor, uh, because uh, you do not need to have land or you do not need to have a lot of investment if you're doing wild collection. You only need to have permission from the local authorities. Um, and, and we would like to support these sort of communities. So this is very important for us. And of course, sustainable wild collection can actually be a very important conservation tool as well. Um, so uh, under the framework of fair wild in this instance. And why we, we want, uh, why we use fair wild is because we pack a, a growing business. We grow um, very fast every year with uh, incredible uh, rates. And what we would like to avoid is, as uh, Susan mentioned earlier, situations where potentially we could fall into over harvesting situations. So managing harvesting and ensuring that we don't over harvest is one of the things or one of the reasons why we use fair wild as a framework. And then the second reason is, is of course, we want to contribute to the communities uh, that are involved in the, in the collection of, of those species that we use in our portfolio. And, and fair wild in this respect gives us the framework or the fair wild standard, I should say, give us this framework under which we can operate, operate and ensure that we meet this criteria. So that was all for me in terms of uh, introduction of why we use uh, wild components and why fair wild is important for us. And then I'll talk a little bit later about licorice, which is a chosen species for us. Great, thank you, Marin. Erin, from Banyan Botanicals. Thank you. Yes, hello. Happy to be here with everybody um, in this really important discussion. And so Banyan Botanicals, we are um, an Ayurvedic lifestyle company and we're based in the US. And we are actually celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Um, and so, you know, compared to some of my other panelists, we are a relatively smaller company. Um, and with that comes some perks and challenges as well, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about um, moving forward in the next session section, but basically we our sourcing regions. We really, we source locally. So, um, in our, we're, you know, Western part of the U S but also just North America, but we also source primarily obviously from India as an Ayurvedic lifestyle company and also from Europe. Um, and as with any herbal, herbal supplement company, wild plants are absolutely our business. Um, they may play an essential role in what we do. And we also have a pharmacopoeia that's quite large, you know, probably about 190 different um, plants. So with that, 
Um, and, and WILD definitely is a big part of that. We have made a lot of progress over the years moving into more cultivated sources, um, but many of the herbs that we still use in our formulas are WILD harvested. And, you know, as an Ayurveda company, the sanctity of nature is one of our key values at Banyans. So it's really important to us that the herbs that we're using are harvested in a sustainable way that is, you know, protecting those plant populations, but also really respects the people that harvest them, as well as all that important knowledge and customs and traditions that go with it. And that's why we really like the Fair Wild Standard and why I really like the Fair Wild Standard is it's really um, one of the best ways, you know, to ensure sustainable use as well as supporting healthy biodiversity, but also really supporting those harvesting communities uh, with fair trade, as well as just acknowledging to the amount, the incredible amount of knowledge um, that these harvesters hold, especially the older generations. Um, we really want to work with that and to protect that. And for us, you know, we'll talk about in the next section, you know, how many of our plants, we don't, we would love more of the plant, wild plants that we source to be fair wild. And there's some challenges with that, which I'm happy to talk about, but we're hoping as time goes on that we'll even expand the portfolio of what we have as fair wild certified. Um, but I'd also say that, you know, not only is nature and the sanctity of nature a key value at Banyan, but I'd also just say that sourcing responsible plant, wild plants like Fair Wild is also just good business. Like it's really an essential part of risk management. Um, and as a company that depends so much on botanical resources, it's really essential that we do business in a way that ensures these resources continue to thrive so that our company can also continue to thrive. It just really, you know, our company and the industry as a whole, if we're going to continue to grow and it's grown at an incredible rate, you know, which is wonderful that people are opening up to and remembering, you know, the benefits that plants can give them, but we have to figure out how to do that in a way that is uh, responsible. And we really feel that fair wild standard is a, is a really important part of that. Um, and I look forward to jumping in to deeper conversation. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Now I wanna, so we've heard from three brands and so we all see their products on the shelf. And now we're gonna go behind the scenes a little bit and speak with and hear from Andrea, sorry, Andrea from Martin Bauer. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Yes, I'm Andrea Romella, and I'm working for the Martin Bauer Group. Uh, this is a company specialized in the procurement of raw materials for the industry. We are offering customized special botanical solutions to companies in different industry sectors like the tea business, but also we also um, provide medicinal plants and extracts and powders. The company is based and was founded in Germany about 19 years ago. So this is also where the name comes from. Martin Bauer was the founder of the company. Um, starting in cultivation originally. And uh, very local cultivation, but step by step spreading and um, growing. And today we are a big uh, group and um, have branches all over the world. So we have 20, 20 uh, branches. And uh, that's why we call it also the Nature Network, because all of us are, um, yeah, deal with uh, plant raw material. <clears throat> we provide about or more than 200 plants from about 80 countries worldwide. And uh, still about two thirds of it come from cultivation, like uh, herbs like everyone knows, like mint and chamomile and fennel and so on. But still one third is, uh, is sourced from wild collection. And there are uh, some prominent species, for example, licorice, uh, like also Marin put it, and but also the flowers, uh, lime flowers, elder, elder flowers, rose is also a big article for Y collection and juniper, to mention some that are placed on the white dozen list. Um, 
And this is also the reason why I work for Martin Bauer, and this is the reason why plants, why plants are my business too. Um, I'm a biologist and I'm working, I'm, I'm responsible for sustainability aspects in, in our supply chains. Uh, so the, in the sourcing of uh, wild, uh, of material coming from the wild, I do assessments. I support our suppliers um, in consulting them and helping them to establish uh, establish the structures and the documentation needed for certification, for example. And um, yeah, sustainability is a very important aspect of our work especially since we released a known, uh, a known sourcing standard since several years and are focusing on trying to, yeah, to enlarge our share of sustainably sourced material. And we uh, already work for a long time with Fairwild, which, is, which I really appreciate very much because Fairwild is, is the kind of a pioneer work in the sustainability from raw material coming from from wild sources, which before wild uh, fair wild, I think, didn't really exist or wasn't um, uh, really present in the people's minds. So I'm happy to be here today and to talk about that um, development, which I think is a growing development. And yeah, happy to share a little bit about our my my daily work and my and our experience. Sorry, I was frozen. Yeah, you're okay. So I'm back. Um, thank you, Andrea. Are you, sorry about that. I wanted to now go back to you, Susan, and see if you could speak a little bit more about the challenges that you all have faced. And I wondered in particular, not so much in sourcing argon and frankincense, although if you want to focus on that, I also wondered in making fair wild work because to your customers. Um, and as a business, because it requires a lot of resources and investment of time and energy and money that can be an obstacle to companies joining in. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Neil Zerodem does have, you know, a reputation for being an uh, unethical and sustainable company. So we put a lot of uh, effort into that. And certainly it does require a lot of resources in order to maintain that, especially with certification. Um, and one of the challenges I'd say we have with um, all certification is that the customer you know, can get overloaded with information these days, can't they? So obviously we have our sort of, you know, deep green customer who cares passionately and will take the time to read about everything. But in terms of messaging, there is a limit to what we can get across, I'd say. Um, so I think the core message that we've kind of chosen to focus on, acknowledging that there's a limit to what we can get across, is certified organic. Um, and then to sort of dig down to another level, then, then we add uh, Fair Wild certified on top of that. So I think that's one thing um, that's quite important. So we put all the background work in, but in terms of what we can actually communicate in um, increasingly sort of short spans of time that people seem to have, um, that, that, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest challenge. So the work goes in. Um, I'd say, you know, also there are challenges with um, uh, Fair Wild certification in, in some ways in um, the fact it's both a strength. Well, it's definitely a strength that it takes both the, the fair trade um, aspect in and the sustainable aspect in. And that's really important. Um, and I'd say in argan oil, the fair, the fair trade side has been, you know, very important to emphasize. In Oman, as I mentioned with frankincense, the sustainability side has been more straightforward to apply in many ways than, um, than getting the certified fair trade side. So 
depending on specific um, circumstances, there are different challenges as well, according to um, culture. And do you have any, I don't know, a success story or what, I mean, any more details about either one of those, like in, in with Argon, how you discovered it was more the social aspects and what you did to address that? Well, it really is by digging deeper, isn't it? And visiting, you know, you have to visit, you can't, you know, just read, you can't just research remotely, you have to actually, you know, you know, I, I from my experience, there is nothing like actually visiting and talking to people to really understand what's going on. You know, certification is the sort of end, if you like, of a lot of background work. You know, it's the end result of a lot of background work that has to go into it, really. I think the rosehip seed oil project that we helped to establish in Serbia, which is a fair wild certified project, is, is I, I think has been the most successful um, project we've we've established in that it you know now provides a um, decent income for you know a number of people about 10 people in Serbia who were very poorly paid and very um, difficult to get you know decent uh, working cash income there um, and that's in addition to the collectors who are also paid a fair a fair wage and you know we do the annual assessment from the sustainability point of view and that's you know also very good and also in addition to that it's a kind of byproduct of the rosehip shells which are also now on the market as fair trade uh, fair wild uh, rosehip shells we've added the seeds which were discarded prior to the project getting established so that's a really nice sustainability um sort of closed loop story i think yeah yeah, great. And adding another source of income at once Absolutely. for the last minute made that so successful, that one project, what factors contributed? Um, I think it was, uh, there was the re there was the real need and demand for the ingredient um, at the time. Um, and again, it's always down to people, you know, there were uh, a family um, business in Serbia that were really good to work with, really prepared to go the extra mile and very well organized and, you know, all, all of that end of it as well. So yeah, that can't be emphasized enough, I think. Great, thank you so much. Obviously there's so much more we could ask about that, but I wanna invite Marin to talk some about a key plant species and some of the lessons, challenges you faced and lessons you've learned from that. Thank you. Um, yes, I was uh, actually going to talk about two different plant species uh, and uh, because we and I couldn't decide, but then the wild doesn't help me decide uh, because there was only one licorice on the list. But I just can I just mention that um, we started a project in India for fair wild trifola and this was the first uh, project in India, first fair wild certified product uh, in India a few years ago. And this was one of the things which I thought I might talk, but um, licorice was on the list and uh, it's quite interesting. Licorice is one of our biggest components. It's actually the biggest component that we use in our teas. We use about 150 tons every year. Uh, so it's, it's, it's massive for us. And it's important really because licorice, the plant part that is used in the licorice is the root or the, or the rhizomes, I should say, because the botanically that's what it is. Um, and these are the reproductive organs and these are the, the kind of the, the roots that support the plants. And if you are harvesting, harvesting roots, they are high risk plant components. You know, if you're harvesting, say, leaves or flowers or seeds, uh, they are slightly different because, of course, there will be impact to the reproduction of the plant or the life of that particular plant, perhaps other elements. But when you harvest the roots, you basically uh, take the plant completely. And uh, there are three different species of licorice that exist or we are aware of, like Raza glabra, uh, Inflata, and Urolensis. And we only use the two of them, which are glabra and um, in, uh, Urolensis. And the reason why we use this is because um, we have to comply to the European pharmacopoeia on glycorrhizic acid content, as far as licorice uh, root in uh, herbal tea preparations is concerned. And with that is the first challenge that we have, is that um, having licorice that is compliant to our specification in terms of glycorrhizic acid content and, and other uh, plant um, 
markers and uh, within the monographs is, is a key challenge for us. And that then restricts a little bit the areas where we can buy licorice from. So currently we source licorice from Spain, Kazakhstan and Georgia, because we felt or we discovered that these were the countries which provided us with licorice uh, that had this particular level of, of glycolytic acid content. Uh, and with that, immediately the geographical scope for our operation then shrinks because we go to a particular area that gives us plant component that has got a particular quality that we're interested. And it's very interesting because licorice uh, we used in one of our teas for the first time in 2012, peppermint and licorice. Um, and it was uh, uh, the first fair wild certified tea on the market. Uh, that was very interesting for us. And in the first year, we had a, a joint project with WWF where we donated 20p from the sale of each pack. Um, and this uh, collaboration worked really well. Uh, and we managed to raise a lot of money uh, to support both WWF as well as our licorice suppliers as well. When it comes to challenges, uh, so this was about the successes of the licorice in our supply chain. Um, when it comes to challenges, I mentioned earlier, the quality of the materials, uh, it has to be organic for us. Organic is a prerequisite. So every material, every uh, product that we sell is organically certified, a little bit like Neo Art. It's kind of the baseline uh, that we operate to. So uh, availability of uh, materials that uh, comply to our specifications is, is a key challenge because we do get variations. The other thing as well, which we sometimes come across is um, uh, availability of collectors and the fact that wild harvesting is not a full-time occupation in most cases, uh, and it is seen as something on the side. And generally we see aging population as far as collectors are concerned. Uh, and for us, uh, this looking forward, is, is a, it's one of the major challenges that we need to address. And it, how do we make wild collection more attractive uh, affair, if you like, or more attractive business for a wider part of the community uh, that may be involved. Um, the other thing as well, which is interesting is, is premiums. When we, when we pay the fair wild premiums, um, they have to go to the collector's community and they then have to decide how they're going to spend these premiums. And it is fairly straightforward if you work in uh, developing countries, for example, in Africa, or in other countries where there's a lot of scope for social programs and improvements. But if you are sourcing from European countries, like for example, Spain, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the basic social needs are already met. Uh, and we do have some challenges in, in decision-making of what the premiums can be spent uh, adequately within the collective community within, within Spain. Something else which was interesting when we were developing the licorice project was uh, the resource assessments. And um, uh, of course they're important, but we wanted to make sure that it is not only the target species that we assess the licorice, we also have to assess all the non-target species that may be present within, within the areas for collection because our activities and our operations on the ground uh, well, of course, will uh, affect to a degree uh, the, you know, the sustainability perhaps or the reproduction of the licorice plants, but what else may be there that may be affected in the same way, even the presence, the human presence, uh, like ground nesting birds and mammals, etc. What, what impact uh, that might have to, that, to, to, to those uh, non-target species. So this was very interesting for us and very reassuring of the robustness of the standard really because Traditionally, you would go and you will assess a, the target species that you're interested in. You'll make sure that you're not over harvesting, but very rarely you go beyond, uh, beyond the target species and what's, what's in there. And I'm going to interrupt you. If yes. You have one more quick thing to wrap it up, and then I'm going to turn to Aaron. Yeah. Uh, one other thing as well I was going to say is because we are growing business, uh, reaching capacity for us was, was very important. And we had an occasion when we, we reached capacity in, in one project and we had to go and we had to uh, source from a different country. And again, this is uh, really reassuring and emphasizes the importance of having the framework of fair wild collection where rather than continuing in over harvesting, you can say, no, I'm gonna stop now here in this area and I'm gonna have to go into somewhere else. 
Um, so yeah, these were the points which uh, I thought might be useful to share as far as licorice collection is concerned. Great, thank you so much. And Marin has spoken a lot more in a recent webinar around the Fairwild Premium and working with that, and that, that we'll have those links that we'll share. Aaron, I wanted to invite you to speak a bit, and in particular um, around how you've navigated this as a smaller company. And there's a question here to maybe weave in about the pricing and how much more you pay for certified Fairwild ingredients and how you balance that additional cost um, with overall production expenses and justifying those higher prices. Mm -hmm. but, but really just how as a small brand you all have navigated this. Sure. Yeah, it's definitely um, more of a challenge. And for Marin, I'll mention the Harataki and Bibitaki and Tripola <laughs> if you want, because there is such a great story there. But for us, you know, it was really essential for us to have good partnerships. That's how we got into it. And for Banyan, they, you know, we partnered with Pucka in the beginning. Um, and that's how we were able to get into Fairwild. Um, having Fairwild Tripola with Bibitaki and now our Hirataki in the Tripola formula, which is a popular Ayurvedic formula. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge for smaller companies, especially one like ours that has such a large um, pharmacopoeia of 100, almost 190 herbs that we're using. It means the quantities of each of those are pretty small. Um, and so you, it's hard to you have the demand. We don't demand enough on our own to go and make it worth the producer's time to do the fair wild standard, which we have to keep in mind too, that this is a lot of work and energy on their end to also take part in this. And they might believe it and want to do it, but it also has to make sense from, for them from a business standpoint. So from a smaller company, I really stress that that's the way to do it is you have to find partners and collaborators to get into it in a way. Um, if you don't require the large enough amounts that are gonna make it worth um, that time. So I think that is a key part of just the industry as a whole is figuring out how to collaborate to make it worth um, while that we can expand this great standard and have more and more wild plants that are following it. Um, and so we really valued that partnership with PECA to allow us to, to do that and to get into it. And it's still a challenge, you know, even now there's more herbs that we're wanting to bring in and we wish that were wild that we wish were under fair wild standard and we still bump up against that amount. Um, and also, you know, smaller companies sometimes might not direct as source, source directly from the countries themselves. They might be working through brokers or distributors. So, and they're also going to be needing to have enough demand basically to make it, to bring in, you know, enough fair wild elderflower that there's enough coming in that, that people are going to want to buy it. And I think for us, you know, from the very beginning at Banyan, it was part of our core pillars that our products were certified organic, sustainably sourced and fair traded. So we just went into the business knowing that was part of what we were doing. And, and from the very beginning, those costs were going to be incorporated in what we offer. Um, so I think it comes to that. I think it's probably definitely a lot harder if you're trying to make that switch and your customers are used to parent paying a certain amount and then you're having to up the amount. But it's very, in the end, it comes down to, I think, as Susan was saying, finding a way to communicate that, why it's important, um, why your prices are at a certain amount to tell that story. So having the storytelling skills from the marketing team as well. Um, but in the end, like I mentioned earlier, it's just part you have to do it for the survival of these important plants and in the long run, the survival of your business. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you wanna, you have one more minute. Do you wanna say anything else about the Harry Taki or like a key success beyond the partnership part? Yeah, just the, I mean, that's the main thing. We're just very, but we also have challenges with that too. Like you can still, um, you know, we wanna keep having it and we'd love for, all of it to be, but there's always going to be challenges from the community side, whether they can um, continue doing that. So I think it, I'd also just say it's really important as Susan and Marin have both talked about too, of just for the companies to be very involved in it and to visit and to 
um, you know, know what's going on at the ground and to be willing to support starting it, you know, to make it happen, to make it a success and not just assume that it's just going to continue to be there. You have to be an active um, participant in it to make it successful. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Now I want to turn to Andrea, who in a way is, you know, you're the one who maybe more often has that direct contact with those supplier communities. And if you wanted to talk a little bit about a particular species and challenges and lessons learned. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm meeting the suppliers often on the field, I'm watching them, collecting, collecting the target species and uh, this is always very interesting to me, as my, the other panelists already mentioned, it is just key to know what is going on on site at the source, to, to understand what are the challenges the, the collectors meet, uh, why do they collect plants, which is uh, for, for many times it's because um, it's it's good for them to have a work in remote areas where there are no other employers, uh, employers say that that can give them jobs, and so they can, for at least part of the year, get some additional income. So, um, and why collection is a very important uh, resource for them. Sometimes also for their own nutrition or for, yeah, their own med medicinal supply. Um, and I think this is one of the main um, positive of, of the main benefits that come from sustainable sourcing that uh, I think was uh, in, in, in the past con that was connected to Y collection is that you didn't really know what you were buying there. Is it the right species? Is where does it come from? Um, how do people do that? Is it the quality that we want to have? So, um, and there is, if you want to sum it up, there is um, a lack of traceability in, in, in material that, that does not come from sustainable sources. And so there are good reasons to follow um, or to, to, to improve that knowledge about the source. And uh, yeah, one example of that, Mari mentioned earlier is licorice. This is also a big and important product for us um, with a very high demand. And uh, yeah, there are several bad news connected to licorice because in some parts of the world, due to the high demand, uh, the populations went down. And so there, there was even a risk. It's, it's a very uh, vital plant. Some uh, some farmers really fear it because it's 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 kind of a weed. But if you overdo it and if you harvest it too often at the same spot and do not leave enough time for regeneration, you will in, in the end, uh, yeah, kill the plant or kill the population. And um, as people who source source uh, these plants are often poor, they are not able or it's not their first part to think about 10 years ahead, but they need to take care for their lives now, for this year, for this season, for this winter. And so we need to, if you want them to source sustainable, we need to help them and, um, and give the, the framework that they are able to do so. And um, yeah, this is one of the reasons why we decided to um, collaborate also with the Fair Wild Standard. Um, since um, already 15 years when it uh, when when the whole thing started, and we are very happy with that, and we are able to build up um, long-term partnerships, um, and where we exactly know what kind of resources do we have, and um, due to our regular visits, we can see um, if regeneration is 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 working. Um, and to be able to provide sustainable material to our customers. Um, yeah, well, what else can I say? <clears throat> Licorice is uh, one of the list from, from the white dozen, but there are also um, challenges from, from other plants not mentioned in the, 
in the white dozen list, but also quite important. If we look, for example, at uh, linden flowers, uh, you have um, the problem that linden uh, or lime trees are high trees, and to um, to be able to to harvest the, harvest the flowers, um, the people used to climb on the trees, and it, it was not rare that the people just dropped off and were injured during collection. And so we uh, were able to provide some of the um, suppliers with uh, safety material that um, and, and give them some training on how to use it so that they are able to, um, to harvest the, uh, the, the flowers without getting in danger of their lives or of their, of their um, health and safety. I have one quick question and then we'll pass it back to Caitlin. Are there, so when you look at Martin Bauer's profile, there's a certain percentage, 60% is sustainably sourced. And I imagine you're trying to increase that amount. And how, how do you, what do you need to increase? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We would of course like to just switch it to 100% like from today or tomorrow. But uh, it's of course not that easy because you need, I would say mainly two things. One is a time or, or patience. And uh, just because it, it's, it's, there are complex structures, especially in wild collections. Oftentimes there are many people involved um, and you have a lot of different areas and so on. So you need to need time to build up uh, relationships to, to have a partner that is, um, yeah, that is willing and and able to show you where where he is sourcing to 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 get an idea about um, the structure and where it comes from and where are the challenges, um, and then step by step implement a system that makes it uh, that makes transparency um, possible, which is uh, the the basic thing if you want to certify it. Because um, and even if you understood the system and know how it worked, you you need to document it so that it becomes um, obvious also to an auditor. And uh, this just needs a lot of time, and this needs also a lot of workforce. So this is a completely completely different story than let's say conventional sourcing, where you just uh, have a list and buy something that is offered on the market. So uh, the involvement is much higher. And uh, yeah, to be able to also pay for that additional um, um, additional costs that, that are connected to it because of the surplus workforce that you need. You, of course, need also customers who uh, are willing and able to, to um, take over some of the costs and um, appreciate that work and uh, also don't do this for for just the spot market but um, are willing to enter long-term relationships because oh, you cannot do a responsible sourcing just for one year next year say hey goodbye that's that's it and uh, we will not meet again because if if, if after two years you come back uh, yeah, well, you, you you destroyed you destroyed the whole partnership you were building in that one year, and that's, this is uh, very very important to us that we can be a reliable partner to our to both to our customers but also to our suppliers. That's great. That so many key themes have emerged in this conversation. We're coming to the end of the time, and I wanted to hand it back over to Caitlin. And I also wanted to encourage Marin and Susan. There's some questions in the Q and A that. If you're able to type, oh, you are typing answers. But Marin, if you want to add an answer in there, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Anne. And thank you so much to all of our speakers. I'm just going to quickly share my screen again. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I feel like that was a very uh, productive session. Thank you everyone for sharing your kind of tips and advice and practical experience. And hopefully that was useful for the people attending today. I think for me, what came through really clearly is the actually the complexity of the social issues as well. Um, so there were things mentioned like the harvesters working part-time, loss of traditional harvesting knowledge, health and safety issues, 
Um, and then how are all of those issues are kind of intrinsically linked to the ecological ones. So about the, the sustainable harvest and the quality. Um, so both actually need to be addressed at once, I think is what that all shows. Um, but also kind of going through the advice um, not to be overwhelmed by this long path to certification. It's actually easier if you can kind of think of it one step at a time. Um, for example, learning from your peers through runs like this, uh, visiting your suppliers whenever you can, prioritizing long-term relationships, um, using tools like Fairwild to kind of build up a stepwise approach, and also um, making use of those tools that uh, Julia mentioned that are coming from traffic and from the FAO. Those will kind of help set you on that responsible sourcing pathway. So I just want to quickly tie things back to Fair Wild Week. Um, that's what we're here to kick off today. So just a reminder, the theme of the event today and also the theme of Fair Wild Week is wild plants are our business. Uh, and here's what you can do to participate in the week. So firstly, you can follow along on social media. So I've put up all of Fair Wilds and all of Traffic's handles there. You can also find all of that from both of our websites. Um, there's a theme for each day of the week. Uh, so they're listed there at the bottom. If you'd like to participate, we'd really encourage uh, everyone, not necessarily just uh, companies that are participating in Fairwild. Um, we'd encourage any company or business or person using uh, wild plant ingredients to participate in the week, especially if you can kind of theme your content to that. Um, but we also have some specific um, uh, tips of how different types of uh, organizations can get involved. So for businesses, we would love you to use the hashtag we use wild to proudly declare your use of wild ingredients. Uh, so essentially just to get more people thinking, more of the market thinking and aware of these wild ingredients. And especially if you can share uh, some of your stories as we have today around responsible sourcing challenges, tips, advice, uh, anything that you can share with your peers will be much appreciated. And we can get more people talking about this very important and timely issue. Um, for consumers, uh, we would like you to participate as well. So you can uh, have a look for wild ingredients in your everyday products, and you can share those using I Found Wild. You can head to the uh, Fair Wild website, and there's a list of ingredients there. Uh, that can help set you on this journey to find wild. You can also use the list of the wild dozen. Uh, and we would love it if you could challenge your favorite companies to declare that we use wild when you do find those uh, wild ingredients. Uh, so participate on all social media platforms and we're on all of them. And make sure you're using the hashtag Fair Wild Week as well with all of those. And Fair Wild will uh, pick up your uh, your tweets or your posts and retweet those. Just to tie it all back again as well to what we mentioned earlier. So there's some tools coming that will help you with this responsible the sourcing journey. Uh, so we've got this wild check platform coming. Um, so traffic has been funded by the Swedish Postcode Foundation very gratefully uh, and also our partners FAO on the call today. Uh, so there will be wild dozen profiles. So those 12 species we mentioned were producing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, risk and opportunity profiles on all of those 12, which will be made public and freely available. We're also gonna be putting out a report uh, with the FAO on the wild dozen species. So on a similar uh, theme. And all of that will hopefully be coming kind of late 2021 or early next year. So do keep an eye out for those and on traffic social media. So one big last thank you to all of our partners, uh, especially the partners that we call today. So FAO and the Sustainable Herbs Program. So thank you so much to Anne for hosting and all of our fantastic speakers. Um, you can see lots of organizations here who are already participating in Fair Wild Week. So you're in good company if you decide to participate with us. Uh, we wanted to bring the event to a close today um, just by asking you to answer our closing poll, which we'll put up now. So the question is, will you be engaging with wild plant sustainability following this event? And if you find that your answer doesn't fit neatly in one of those responses, you can always drop a comment in the chat as well. We'd love to see that and get some feedback. So we'll leave that running for a moment. 
Um, but I think that is all for me. So yeah, just once again, to encourage everyone to participate in this Fair World Week uh, happens every year in June. So do uh, keep following us after the week as well and keep tuning in future years. Um, we'd love to see kind of a, a paradigm shift in wild plants uh, harvesting and sourcing and a real kind of industry-wide move towards sustainability. So sorry if you can hear my dog whining in the background. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Caitlin, and thank everyone for joining. Thank you again for the sponsors that made it possible. And we are going to try and create some short video clips from key points from this webinar, and hopefully we'll do it soon, so that those of you who are here will share that, and then you can share that on social media and really trying to capitalize on a lot of the really important points about how to raise more awareness and action that emerged from this. So thank you all for joining.